Welcome back again, church, as we are in our third week of looking at the will of God. And we're going to look at something as a reminder, uh, something a little different. Uh, it's still the will of God, as it says uh, in the scripture, as you will, as you will find out shortly. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew 18 and verses 10 through 14 uh, specifically, but it's going to be a great reminder for, uh, for mature Christians, for those who have been in the faith for a while. And looking at uh, young Christians and those who are young in the faith. And it's, uh, it's very enlightening but challenging at the same time. Just the way scripture always is. It's, uh, it's just amazing how God speaks to us over and over again. But I found this passage just extremely fascinating. And I wanted to share it with you this week about what the will of God is. Uh, especially since everybody's in a little bit different place in their walk with the Father. In their relationship with Jesus. Uh, so let's, let's just read these couple verses here. This is in uh, Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? And if a, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And so there's a... Uh, there's a parallel passage in Luke chapter 15 where it talks about the lost sheep as well, but there's a, a, uh, a very large difference between the two. In Luke, it talks about uh, sinners coming to salvation. In Matthew here, in 10 through 14, it talks about those who are already saved and weak in the faith and may be experiencing some difficulties uh, some trials, some infirmities, some uh, some challenges in their life that cause them to go astray, or there maybe there's periods of rebellion that's that's there in the process. But if you look at this, uh, just just in ten, it says, "Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones." Now, if you go all the way back up to uh, to verse three and verse four, when Jesus answers, uh, "Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven?" Uh, the great question that he throws out there. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He uses this metaphor, this, this, uh, this picture, this analogy, I should say, probably more apt uh, to say, to, to point of those who are young, young in the faith, those who are uh, uh, childlike in their understanding of their obedience and responsibilities, who God is, what his commandments are, uh, letting go of the world and putting on more of Jesus in the process. Uh, so it says, take heed, little ones. Now, I, I, why does this stand out so much? Right? That's the great question. Why does this stand out for me so much? And it comes down to uh, simply that pride aspect. Sometimes... And it happens to everybody, so if you think you've never had this happen to you, you'd be wrong. It happens to everybody at one point in time or another, and it often revolves itself uh, to the spot where we can, we can look down at uh, younger Christians and just wonder why it is they're struggling in the fashion that they are, or that we uh, who have been in the faith longer are somehow better and, and uh, our wisdom is greater than their wisdom, and, and there are some pieces that are. But it doesn't mean that uh, words that are shared aren't just as convicting if they're coming from the Word of God, from their life to ours, right? Do we look down upon those uh, sometimes who are weak in the faith or battling with struggles? I, I mean, it's a it's a great question, and the answer I told you, you know, like I said, the answer is uh, yeah, we do we do do this from. From time to time so what is it that we have to do we have to humble ourselves and see if uh, we are an offending party is our life one that is tearing them down and bringing them down to humiliation or degradation in the process do we count them worthy 
as they are a child of God, as we were in a similar place at one point in our life, do we count them as a beloved member of the family or do we look, them as, look at them as the, uh, the unwanted child? Right? And God says this very clearly. Uh, in right in 14, even so it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What is the will of God? The will of God is that he protects his children. And the perish, if you look at that word, really it, it's referring to the, the spiritual devastation that can happen in a, in a Christian's life, in a believer's life. You know full well it only takes one decision uh, to turn a perspective and to be able to justify another decision uh, that leads you away from the greatness of God, the, the, the goodness of the cross, the greatness of Jesus Christ, the, the gospel of salvation for all mankind. So I'm going to read, I want to read a little bit of a, a commentary from Matthew Henry. He points out some very good things for us to think about. Uh, but let me share this with you because it stands out for me today. He says, the infant seed of the faithful, the infant seed of the faithful belong to the family of Christ and are, and are not to be despised. Or figuratively, true but weak believers are these little ones who in their outward condition or the frame of their spirits are like little children, the lambs of Christ's flock. We must not despise them, not think meanly of them as lambs despised. We must not make a jest of their infirmities, not look upon them with contempt, not conduct ourselves scornfully or disdainfully toward them, as if we cared not what became of them. We must not say, though they be offended and grieved and stumble, what is that to us? Nor should we make a slight matter of doing that which will entangle and perplex them. This despising of the little ones is what we are largely cautioned against in Romans chapter 14. And I'm going to read that for you in just a minute. It says, We must not impose upon the consciences of others nor bring them into subjection to our own humors, as they do who say to men's souls, Bow down that we may go over. There is respect owing to the conscience of every man who appears to be conscientious. And... Really, that's a, uh, I, mean, I, I don't think I could come even close to wording it as well as that, as beautiful as that as he does. Uh, but he gives us these, these reminders of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 14, which goes on the fact of not only do we look upon them meanly, but do we do something in front of someone who has previously struggled with a sin that we think we have no problems with and cause them uh, to stumble in their faith whether it's our language, whether it's our consumption of food or drink, uh, which is a big one, could be either or, uh, could, be, could be places that are visited, company that is kept. Uh, all of these things have to be in, in, uh, in our minds when we look upon those who are weak in the faith or struggling with, with, with things that they, uh, they, they previously, previously stumbled over or continue to stumble over. But in Romans chapter 14, and it starts off in the first three verses, he says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Okay, so, and then we're going to move on to... Uh, to verse 10 and read down through through 21 because it gets a little little more in the explanation for uh, the <laughs> of how we judge our brothers in a unbiblical manner so here it says but why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother for we all start or for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. 
I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Something, something that we must think about. It is the will of God that we help mature and, and disciple our brothers and sisters. It is the will of God that we do not lead them astray because of our own uh, liberties or what we believe are our own liberties. It is putting someone else above our desires, above our interests, above what we think we are free uh, to do. So that way we are not looking down on another individual, another brother or sister in Christ thinking, well, you should be strong enough to be able to handle it. I'm strong enough to be able to handle it. That is, that is nothing but pride leaking out on the words and the lips and ultimately is on the borderline of a great fall for uh, those who are tiptoeing that line of sin. And pride will knock you down faster than anything else in that process. So the will of God, when we look at this, if somebody is, if their conscience is moved, is, uh, is, uh, is pricked to the spot of it is not good for them, then maybe we should really think about that and honor their convictions. Do we need to have all the same minor convictions? No. Are they biblically oriented for many? Some of them are. Some of them may not be. But if it causes somebody to sin or causes somebody to look on something and, and begin to sin or be tempted by it, it is our job to not allow that to happen and to promote goodness and to promote peace, to promote joy, to promote maturity in the word, in, in faith in Jesus Christ, instead of looking down on a brother, losing a sheep, for it is the will of God. God says, I will protect even the lowest, the smallest, I should say, not the lowest, but the smallest of my children, the, the infant-like of my children with great ferocity. And it's, uh, it's time that we look upon people or we remember uh, to look upon those who are in different levels of their relationship with Jesus Christ with the same sensitivity and the same devotion uh, that God looks upon us as his children. There are days that we are strong. There are days that when we, you know, we are very, very weak. And it is by the grace of God that he makes us strong yet again. So as a family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, what is the will of God? The will of God is to look upon our infant uh, brothers and sisters, those who are weak and those who are struggling, as just that, that they are brothers and sisters in need of help. And who can counsel better than the Lord himself from his very word? And if that requires us from not partaking in something for a brief period of time, or perhaps, I challenge you, perhaps letting it go for your life here on this earth for the sake of more than just that brother or sister, but perhaps many, maybe it's time that we, uh, we think about doing that for the honor of God and the building up of our, of our church family, of our brothers and sisters. It's quite an interesting passage in Matthew. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little children. Take heed, and I encourage you as we as you as you go about it, or you're, you're dealing with people in the church, or you're uh, you're meeting people of you know around the town or around the country as as you go about your your travels. Understand, people struggle. 
we struggle. <laughs> we struggle greatly. But God, being the great shepherd, just as he says in John chapter 10, uh, will not allow the enemy to snatch anyone, any one of his children out of his hand, and he will do what is necessary to prevent uh, the great spiritual devastation that would lead them away from him. We have a great God. As is continually said, we have a great God, and praise the Lord uh, that he is so faithful and loving and such a great shepherd. Is that the voice you hear today? And let's, let's make sure our brothers and sisters in their times of growing and struggle hear the voice of God for their growth, edification, correction even, instead of ours. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for these great words that are written for us as we just look over them briefly, Lord. May we, may we look at our brothers and sisters uh, through the eyes of love, your love, through the words of truth, uh, again, your truth. Lord, may we not judge them in effect of, of a sinful manner, but be of one that helps them stay on, on a path to righteousness and holiness as you have already deemed through your word, not by our judgments, not by our opinions, uh, but by what you have already stated of how we are to act, behave, follow, put on, and put off. And may we uphold our weaker brothers and sisters in their struggles, just as we hope that they would uphold us in ours. Lord, for your glory, for our transformation into righteousness through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask this in, uh, in the name of our beloved Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I hope you're, uh, I hope you're enjoying your time in the will of God, uh, because it's going to be, we're going to continue on for a little while, just picking out little pieces about what God wants for us. And it's real exciting, real exciting to be not only with you all, but to be in the word, learning about who God is. And I hope you find it just as exciting. We'll see you next week.